I'd like to introduce our guest. Our first speaker for today is Ms. Holly Austin Smith. Holly? She has an awesome story we'd like to share, and I'll introduce Holly. Holly Smith is a survivor of child sex trafficking. When she was 14 years old, on a summer break from eighth grade middle school, and her freshman year of high school loomed in the distance, she was lured into running away from home with a man she had met at a shopping mall in Atlanta City, New Jersey. After exchanging numbers, this man called her at night while her unknowing parents watched television in the living room. They talked more than once. Convincing her to run away with him was not an overnight accomplishment. He took his time. He got to know her. Within hours of running away with a man who turned out to be a manipulative pimp trafficker, she was forced into prostitution into New Jersey, Atlantic City. Students and guests, let's welcome Holly Smith, our student. <laughs> to tackle on a Monday morning, so I appreciate your, your being here and your attention. I'm going to read a little bit from my book, Walk and Pray, so just bear with me. June 1992, South Jersey. I was looking for something. It was the summer after my eighth grade middle school graduation, and I had been looking for something ever since that school year had begun. The song, When It's Love, by Van Halen was still popular, and I would turn up the radio dial to listen to the lyrics. Sammy Hager sang about waiting and wanting to connect with someone. I was the same way. I stared into the faces of strangers as they passed by me in large crowds, a habit I had picked up that year. I was looking for someone to acknowledge me in some way. I thought, if someone noticed me, if somebody, anybody, didn't look away when I bumped into his view, that I would know that I was really there, that I was alive and solid and visible. And then one day, somebody did. I was walking through the mall with friends, searching each face when I noticed a man watching me. I held his stare, waiting for him to turn away, and then he raised his finger and curled it back, motioning for me to come over to him. I blinked and looked behind me, thinking for sure he must be talking to someone else, but nobody was there. I looked back at him and he curled his finger again, motioning for me to come over. I shook my head no. He dropped his fist and continued to watch me. I looked around to see if anyone noticed the exchange. My best friend and her boyfriend had stopped at the Pearson Pagoda. My other friends loitered around them and everyone else in the world continued to look over me, past me, or through me. Only this guy noticed my existence. It was a moment for which I had been waiting. A stranger who lived out there in the real world spotted me and invited me in. I was unsure of what to do, hesitant, yet I was equally afraid I might miss this opportunity. An opportunity for what? I didn't know, but I wanted to find out. I'll be right back, I said to Crystal, my best friend, who shrugged as she held a pair of silver hoop earrings against her ear. Didn't this scare you, I've been asked? No, it didn't. What scared me in middle school was the idea of losing my friendship with Crystal. The threat of never finding a real boyfriend and the fear of social humiliation, especially from losing in a public fist fight. Although I pretended to be tough, I was secretly afraid of getting beat up in high school. I felt like a coward and I feared exposure. Strangers, however, were low on my radar for danger. I wasn't afraid of them, I was intrigued by them. I saw them as portals into another world outside of Tuckerton, New Jersey, a world I so badly wanted to join. The guy in the mall didn't appear creepy or threatening. He looked cool. He was in his early 20s, wearing a bum sweatshirt with gold chains around his neck. Most important, I felt special that he pointed me out of the crowd instead of Crystal, or one of her more outgoing new friends, all of whom I believed to be prettier or cooler or just more fun than me. I was more nervous than fearful about approaching the guy in the mall. I worried he would turn me away, realizing he had made a mistake and leave me feeling stupid. 
I quickly concocted a plan to ask him for pot if the introduction was awkward. I had tried pot only once, and I did it out of spite more than curiosity. Crystal started smoking pot with her boyfriend, and I was jealous. I thought if I could gain a connection for pot from this guy, then maybe I could gain a solid spot in Crystal's new crowd. Yes, this was my great big concern in middle school, the fear of being left out and left behind. It turned out that my nervousness was for naught. The man with the gold chains leaned out of the payphone booth and said very directly to me, remember this number. And then he said a phone number. Got it, I said. He then turned away from me and pulled himself back into the booth as though the conversation was over. What do you want me to do, I asked. He held up the phone and wrote the number on the palm of my hand. Call any time, he smiled broadly. And that was it. That was how I met my trafficker. There was no violence, no threats, no screeching car on the street, and no screaming or kicking abduction. There was only mystery and an offer of friendship. I walked back to my friends and shrugged at Crystal's puzzlement. Oh, that guy, I said? That's one of my dad's friends. Looking back, I realized this quick exchange between us was purposeful. The man with the gold chains probably didn't want to call attention to the fact that he had just engaged with a random young girl. Just as passersby took little notice, so did my friends. And I was equally relieved by the brief exchange between us. I talked to him on my private phone line as I had done many nights with my friends and my friends' friends and my friends' older brothers and even their friends. Unfortunately, I didn't know that my new friend Greg was actually a pimp. So after exchanging numbers, we talked on the phone for a few weeks, and he told me things like, I was pretty enough to be a model. I was too mature to go to high school. He told me things like, if I chose to run away with him, he could get me into adult dance clubs, and I could meet famous people, and especially famous fans. I chose to run away about two weeks after meeting him. And what I didn't know at the time was that the person that I was talking to on the phone for those two weeks was a completely different person than the man that I had met at the mall. I actually didn't find that out for about 15 years until I drove to New Jersey to collect my case files. After I ran away and met this guy at the mall again, within hours, I was forced into prostitution in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So I'm here to tell you, it's, it's not easy to share my story, but I want to share my story with you so that others know that this is happening, that it was happening 20 years ago, and that it's still happening today. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to tell you, to talk to you about human trafficking in the United States. So what is human trafficking? It's a global issue that affects men, women, and children. And it's been estimated that as many as 27 million men, women, and children are victims of trafficking at any given time. The United Nations defines human trafficking as the acquisition of people by improper means, such as force, fraud, or deception, with the aim of exploiting them. Such exploitation can be in the form of prostitution, forced labor, removal of organs, and other forms of exploitation. In the United States, human trafficking is generally broken down into two categories, exploitation via forced labor and exploitation via forced commercial sex. And commercial sex can be prostitution, it can be stripping in a club, it can be pornography. So as a survivor, I encourage students to educate their peers on child sex trafficking. And I've come up with some curricula for students and teachers, and it's really meant for a group of stu students to work with at least one teacher with this curriculum. So I encourage you to educate your peers on the existence of child sex trafficking within the United States, the common tactics of sex traffickers, and those risk factors in the community that increase the likelihood of child sex trafficking. So I wanted to just show you uh, a few examples of not only child sex trafficking happening in the United States, but happening in North Carolina. In, 
October 2013, a 20-year-old college student was charged with sex trafficking a 17-year-old girl in Raleigh. In November, three men were charged with sex trafficking a 14-year-old in Brevard. A 33-year-old man was sentenced to 45 years in prison for trafficking two girls, one aged 14 and the other aged 15. <coughs> A 21-year-old man was arrested for trafficking a 17-year-old girl in Raleigh. A 24-year-old man was arrested for sex trafficking a minor in Wilmington. And a 15-year-old girl was found to have been lured away from home and coerced into prostitution by an older woman <coughs> in Charlotte. So uh, it's almost, uh, it's a, this story is very similar to my own story, yet it's 20 years later. Common Tactics of Sex Traffickers. In Appendix C of my book, Walking Prey, I offer 10 tips for teens to protect themselves against traffickers. Number nine is to understand how child sex trafficking works. Traffickers hang out in the same places you do. I met mine at a mall. They also hang out at skating rinks, bus stations, and online, anywhere they might be able to find a teenager. Traffickers may not appear to be sketchy characters. They can be young. You saw some of the guys who were in their early 20s in the prior stories. They can be well-dressed, and they can just come across as being really cool. Traffickers may offer to buy you trendy clothes, shoes, cars, or other expensive items as a way of gaining your trust and your interest in them. Traffickers may ask for your phone number. They may ask to see or speak to you alone. Traffickers may tell you how pretty and mature you are, and they may mention knowing celebrities, exotic dancers, and models, and other famous people. Traffickers may attempt to date you, befriend you, offer to help you make a lot of money, or offer to help you run away. In chapter two of Walk and Pray, I mentioned Stacy Lundgren. Um, who's also the founder of the Stacy Project. She's out of California. I think she just recently moved to Texas. Stacy felt disconnected from her parents because they had divorced and her father was often absent. Like many kids, Stacy was bullied in school. As a result of her home and school life, Stacy struggled with depression and loneliness. She met an older guy online who told her that he liked her. He lured her into a relationship offline, and then he eventually forced Stacy to trade sex for money with other men. Common tactics of sex traffickers. They will often pretend to be the perfect boyfriends, and then they will ask their girlfriends for favors. These favors can seem harmless at first, and then gradually lead to greater exploitation. Or the boyfriend may suddenly become violent and demand the girl to do what he says, or he might blackmail her. Uh, there's a story that's well known out of Ohio where this uh, girl, Teresa Flores, when she was a girl, she was um, caught, uh, she was doing something that was caught on camera and somebody blackmailed her um, into doing what he wanted her to do or he would show these photos to, to her parents. This is something that actually often happens in the United States today. Girls and boys are blackmailed this way. Or he could use drugs and violence as a way to control her, or he might encourage her to run away and quickly move her to a different city or state in order to isolate her and, and get her out of her surroundings. That's exactly what happened to me. Um, I was taken from my hometown of Tucker, New Jersey, to Atlantic City, New Jersey, where, of course, I didn't know anybody. These are all tactics, and all of these examples are important when discussing child sex trafficking with your peers. The more you educate your peers about the tactics of traffickers, the better equipped they will be to detect red flags in potentially exploitative relationships. It's important to remember that boys can and are victims, can be and also are victims of sex trafficking, and that traffickers, as well as their accomplices, can be any age, class, or gender. For example, in Walking Prey, I present examples in which gang members and pimps use an older girl to build trust with younger victims, and gay or transgender adults may reach out to gay, transgender, or questioning youth for the purpose of sex trafficking. Who can be a trafficker? 
It can be anyone. It can be a family member, a friend. There are, there ha there are teenagers out there who have been um, convicted of sex trafficking peers. An acquaintance, a known pimp, a known gang member, or a known member of organized crime. The following factors in any community can raise the chances of crossing paths with a trafficker or another exploiter. Presence of a legal or illegal commercial sex industry. So if there's an area known for prostitution, if there's an area well known for um, sex clubs, those areas increase your chances of running across an exploiter. So it's important to know that. If you live in a community that has that, it's important to tell your peers that these are, these are risk factors. Presence of large groups of single men, that's usually pointed out if there's um, sporting events, conferences, um, high transit areas, which I think Raleigh is uh, a, a very high transit area. Proximity to truck stops. Proximity to international borders. Presence of gangs and a homeless youth culture. And a, a homeless youth culture, um, it, it, if there are homeless youth who travel together, they are often targeted by exploiters, especially traffickers. So if you live in an area with that kind of culture, there is um, an increased likelihood that you can run across an exploiter. So for those of you who are very interested in this topic, I encourage you to extend your efforts beyond education on human trafficking to include education and prevention for those predisposing factors that often make children vulnerable to exploitation. So traffickers are looking for vulnerable people. And this is the reason why they often target young teenagers. But if there are young teenage, the teenagers that are more vulnerable than another teenager, you're going to go after that teenager. These are some risk factors. If, it, if a child is um, experiencing physical abuse at home, neglect, if they're living in poverty, if they're runaways, um, if they're struggling with bullying, if they have lack of supervision at home, unsupervised access to the internet, history of foster care, difficulty in school, any one of these factors can make one person more vulnerable than another to an exploiter. So if you get involved with human trafficking, education, and prevention, especially child sex trafficking in the United States, I really include you, I encourage you to include in your presentation education and prevention efforts on these predisposing factors. Anything that you identify in your peers that can make them more vulnerable to someone else, look for ways to help those teens. Media literacy is something that I touch on a lot in Walking Prey. Because traffickers often target children who are more vulnerable than others, including those who are overexposed to and influenced by negative messages in the media. So those negative messages can include um, the sexual objectification of women in the media. Think of uh, Miley Cyrus's recent videos. Um, Think of fashion magazines where there's always some sort of objectified woman on the cover. If you know girls who are very influenced by those messages, they can be sexualized, they can be um, easily influenced by others, and traffickers will target those kinds of victims or potential victims. I highly encourage you to educate your peers about negative societal influences in the media, the constant sexual objectification of women, and music videos and advertising can influence girls to view themselves as commercial and sexual objects. These same messages can influence boys to view girls in the same way. This sort of culture just makes it easier for exploitation to happen. In Walking Prey, I recommend um, several documentaries to educate students on, this, on these topics. So uh, I wanna, I want to just touch on a couple things. If any of you come across a victim of trafficking, I want to encourage you to show that person compassion. After I was trafficked and I tried to return to my high school, um, I was made fun of and I was called a lot of names. 
to the point that I had to leave high school and I had to go, I, I wound up bouncing around to a lot of different schools because I was so ashamed and sad. So please show um, your peers compassion for, for any kind of victimization. And I want to share that these stories do not all have unhappy endings. Victims grow up to be survivors and they accomplish amazing things. I want to tell you about Neat Childs. Neat was a victim of sex trafficking when she was a teenager. She overcame that over many years and today she has her own bakery. It's called Neat's Sweets and she's in Charlotte, North Carolina. So if you decide to put together any kind of a, an education or prevention program, I encourage you to reach out to Neat Sweets and see if you can include their baked items or if you can include flyers from her business because her bakery uh, funds a nonprofit that helps victims of sex trafficking in North Carolina. And, and that's all I have for you. And I want about something that's so important.